Hello and welcome to Zenith Corporate School English. In today's lesson, we'll be looking at an overview of the IELTS test. So, what is IELTS? IELTS, or the International English Language Testing System, is an international standardized test of English language proficiency for non-native English language speakers. So, if you want to work or study in a country where English is the language of communication, for example, in the UK, you need to take IELTS. It is also necessary for immigration. So, next, let's look at who the test is for. If you plan to enroll at a university or college, apply to business organizations, or register for a visa from government agencies, in countries such as the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, or Canada, the IELTS test can help you reach your education, career, or life goals. So, let's get to the test overview in detail. IELTS evaluates or it checks your English on the basis of receptive and productive skills. The receptive skills are listening, reading, while the productive skills are writing and speaking. So, in other words, the listening and reading part help to show what you have, the knowledge of English that you have in you, and how you're able to understand this language. But the writing is the result part. So, you have to write and prove what knowledge you have and how you can apply them in writing and in speaking. The exam is both for the general test, so those who are writing for the purpose of work, that is the general test, and academic test, those who are writing for study purposes. So let's get to the four parts of the test. You are going to have listening for 40 minutes, and you are going to have reading for 60 minutes. The writing part also is for 60 minutes, whilst the speaking part is for 11 to 14 minutes depending on the exam and the examiner and how long you take to speak in this course we'll be dealing mainly with the speaking part the listening reading and writing part takes place on the same day of the test but the speaking could be on a different day depending on your exam center so let's look at the IELTS band score what does it mean band Band simply means the marks that are given during the exam. How are they calculated? So all IELTS scores are between 0 and 9. You can also get a 0.5 score, for example, 7.5 or 8.5. You will get a band score for each skill, which are listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And also you will get an overall score, which is the average of all the skills. Let's look at a table and see an example. So here we have listening. Let's assume you took the exam and you had 8.0 in listening, 7.5 in reading, 8.0 in writing, and 8.0 in speaking. The overall score will be the average of your listening, reading, writing, and speaking. So when you add everything together and divide by 4, you will get approximately 7.8. So what happened is that this 7.8 will be rounded off to the nearest whole number, which is 8.0. So that is how the scores, the IELTS band scores are calculated. So let's see the scores here. We have scores ranging from 5 to 9 and what they mean. So 9 means that you are an expert user. You have a range of vocabulary. You speak fluently with very, very low mistakes. So you are an expert user. And 8 is a very good user. You have not so frequent mistakes and you speak fluently too with a range of vocabulary. 7 is a good user. You have frequent mistakes, but you have a range of vocabulary and you also speak fluently and six is a competent user five means modest user 
So this means you have frequent mistakes, your vocabulary range is not so much, and you also try to speak fluently. So next, let's look at the IELTS speaking, because in this course, we'll be focusing only on the IELTS speaking. The speaking part consists of part one, which is a brief introduction and conversation with the examiner. Then you get to part two, where you are given a topic to speak on in one to two minutes. You have one minute to prepare. And part three, which will be a discussion based on the topic you spoke about in part two. So, what next? Now you know about the test, it's time for us to begin. Our next aim is to master part one, then part two, and part three. We will take it step by step so that when we are done, you will be sure to perform excellently during the speaking test. So, in the next video, we'll begin with part one, where we'll master the vocabulary and then get to part one speaking. For now, thank you very much for listening and see you at the next video. Hello once again and welcome to Zenith Corporate School English. In today's lesson, we'll be looking at the IELTS speaking part one. What is it about? So let's get started. Uh, firstly, we have an overview of this part one test and it's for both those taking general and academic IELTS. Remember I mentioned earlier that there are two categories of IELTS, that is the general for those that want to work in English speaking countries like the UK or Australia or Canada and the academic IELTS for people that want to study in these countries. So the part one takes about four to five minutes. It starts with the introduction plus short conversation. That is the first part. So once you come to the exam, you are required to give your identification number or any other documents that, that are required. And then you have a short conversation. You have an introduction first uh, where you greet the examiner. We are going to look at the introduction, how to respond and how to greet the examiner in a different video. And after the introduction, you have a short conversation. Now, after that, the these conversation, the topics range from hometown, neighborhood, family, work, friends, study, hobbies, food, and sports. And you need to note here that there is a possibility to have other topics in this first part of speaking, but these are the common ones. And with the knowledge you have from these ones, you can do well in any other topics. So you are scored based on four criteria. And these are, the first one is fluency and coherence. You have about 25% from that. So in this, you need to avoid pausing and hesitating too much. For example, so where are you from? I'm from, um, um, so this is pausing and hesitating too much. You should avoid doing that. You should organize your answers. Of course, the examiner is not going to be checking if you organized your answers or not, but it's expected of you to organize your answers. Use connecting words and phrases. For example, well, I believe, generally, I think. So these are connecting words and phrases. We are going to learn them, so don't worry for now. The next is lexical resource. What does that mean? It means your range of vocabulary. Try not to use less common vocab. So the next one is collocations. For example, you have deep, deep feeling, deep pockets, deep sleep, deep trouble. So putting two words together, two nouns or two adjectives together to form uh, to make a meaning. You have heavy, heavy rain, heavy sleeper, a heavy drinker, heavy snow, heavy traffic, strong, strong smell, strong sense. So these are collocations that you can use to build your lexical resource. And of course, like I said earlier, use less common vocabulary. So instead of saying, um, instead of saying, 
food, you can use cuisine. So don't worry, we're going to look at these words just for you to understand better and do very well in your exam. So we'll look at all these when we get to the speaking proper. The next is your grammar range and accuracy. So the tenses you use for the past, present and future. Hypothetical situations, would plus infinitive, like I would like to travel, I would like to do something. And speculating with modal verbs using may, might, could, etc. So your grammar range, how much of grammar that you know is also, um, you're also judged based on that. And the final one is your pronunciation. So the stress, the intonation. So words like cuisine, women, usually, early. You can see here mistake. So the intonation is the stress is on the second syllable, like mistake, democracy, photograph, photography. So we have photograph, photography. Photographic. So you can hear the stress in the first, second, and the third syllable in different words. So your intonation during questions and exclamations. For example, really? Are you going today? So you can hear the intonation. It's not just monotone. So try not to talk in monotone. Instead, use different stresses and intonation. So do's and don'ts. Let's begin with the do's. So you should be confident, friendly, and maintain eye contact with the examiner. Try not to look down when speaking. Excitement, you should be happy when speaking about something. And your vocabulary, like I said earlier, uh, food, you can say cuisine, friends, acquaintance, these are other vocabulary that you can use. Try to use high level vocabulary like I enjoy, I prefer, I recommend, etc. Expand your answers. For part one, I recommend two to four sentences. Do you like to study? Don't just say no. You can say, yes, I do. I spend about three to four hours every day in the library studying. It makes me more confident. And of course, you need to practice, practice, practice. So even after this video, go through the video again and again and make sure you practice. Record yourself and listen to yourself to see how much improvement you've made. Let's look at the don'ts. So do not speak with a monotone. Speak with enthusiasm. Speak with zeal, like with passion. So when you're talking about uh, something you enjoyed or something you really liked, you should be more passionate about it. You should speak with excitement. Don't give yes or no answers. Do you like sports? No. Don't give such answers. Try to make it longer and try to give to, to talk at length, especially during the part two and part three. For part one, you can give about two to three sentences. And do not repeat the question. You can ask for clarification. For example, do you like sports? Do you like sports? So don't repeat the same question that the examiner said. But you can ask for clarification. I'm very sorry, but could you repeat the question? Do not go off topic. When you're given a question about sports, do not start talking about traveling or do not start talking about food. You should stay on the topic. Even if you want to digress, make sure it's still on the basis of the topic you're given. Do not answer, I don't know. You should be able to say something at every question. And do not speak too quickly or too slowly. Speak quietly and be audible. Speak loud enough for your examiner to understand what you're saying. And finally, do not worry about perfect English. Remember, the main aim of this test is to look at your English proficiency, how well you speak English. So make sure that you are loud. Even if there, is, there are mistakes during your speaking, do not worry about it. You can always correct yourself and repeat what you wanted to say. But make sure that you're making complete sentences with the perfect grammar, which we're going to learn during this course, and you will come out successfully. So the aim of the part one is to make you feel comfortable with the examiner and ready to 
to do part two and part three of the speaking. I believe you've been able to learn a lot about the first part of this art test and by the next video we will get to part one in detail and we will have a lot of speaking and you will see how to attack the questions and how to come out successful with a good score for this test. See you at the next video and please go through the videos to understand what we discussed about. Welcome to Zenith Corporate School English. In today's lesson, we'll be looking at part one IELTS speaking, and we will learn how to greet the examiner, how to talk about your hometown, and how to use a wide range of vocabulary for town and cities. So today's lesson will be strictly based on part one of IELTS speaking. And we will be looking at one topic, and that is town and cities. So let's get started with the speaking practice. Firstly, let's look at greeting the examiner. So when the examiner comes and asks you questions like, could I see your identification, please? How do you respond to the examiner? There are a lot of ways to respond to the examiner, but we are going to look at two different ways. And these are, sure, here it is, please take a look, or sure, here you are. So when you say this sentence, you present your identification to the examiner. And if you are asked, what is your full name? You could say, my full name is James Scott, but you can call me James. Another way to say this is, my full name is James Scott, you could just refer to me as James. So you can memorize, you can learn to use these ways of responding to questions. What is your full name and could I see your identification please? And use them during the exam. But be sure not to speak as though you memorize the answers. Let it flow naturally from you. So when given the answers, Please make sure you're not just cramming and saying what you learned from the lesson. So try to understand the structure of the sentence. So once again, my full name is James Scott, but you can call me James. My full name is James Scott, you could just refer to me as James. So you can choose either of them to use on the day of the exam. So let's get to the first question. So after looking at your identification and giving you back the uh, ID, you could be asked a question like this. Where is your hometown? Now remember not to give one sentence answers or fast answers like my hometown is London and that's it. That is not a great answer. So let's look at a structure you can use here. My hometown is in, let's say, Ottawa. So my hometown is in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. It is located in the north of the country, not really far from Alaska. So you just answered not only where you live, but the location of the place. So let's go again. My hometown is in Ottawa, which is the capital of it is located in the north of the country, not really that far from Alaska. What if your hometown is not the capital? Another way you can say this. You can say, my hometown is in, let's say, uh, another city like Alaska or another smaller city. So you can say, my hometown is a small city in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. And it is located on the north or on or in the south of the country, not really that far from somewhere. So you can use the same structure for your hometown. In case it's not the capital, you don't have to mention capital. You can say, my hometown is in somewhere, which is in another bigger city. And it's located in the south of the country. Okay. So let's get to the second question. 
do you like living in the city? So you can say, yes, I do. There are numerous opportunities and places of interest in the city which you cannot get in the suburbs. There are a lot or there are lots of lively bars and restaurants within walking distance of my apartment. I'm a bit of a culture voucher as well, so it's great to have access to arts exhibitions and that kind of thing. These and more make living in the city interesting for me. In answering this question, you didn't just say, yes, I like living in the city. You gave extra information. Now, let's look at this structure. Firstly, we said, yes, I do. There are numerous, there are many opportunities. So numerous is a higher vocabulary for uh, many. So numerous opportunities and places of interest in the city, which you cannot get in the suburb. Suburb is like outside the city. There are lots of lively bars and restaurants and within walking distance of my apartment. So you're trying to explain why living in the city is good. So make sure you include two, one or two extra sentences after the first one. So here we have about three sentences, extra sentences, two extra sentences to back up uh, the first answer that we gave. Yes, I do. So we get to the next question. Do you live in a small town or big city? We have a sample answer here. Well, I grew up in a small town, but I've been living in a reasonably big city for about five years now. It's big and beautiful, or it's a big and beautiful city. So, do you live in a small town or big city? You can say, well, I live in a big city, or I live in a small city. But, actually, I lived in a bigger one in the past, so this is an extra sentence you're given. It's a big and beautiful city, or it's a small but beautiful town, lovely town. Okay, now, this could, these are extra sentences you can use to back up your answer for such questions. And the next question, is there much to do in your hometown? Oh, yes! There's certainly lots to do there, as it's fairly, it's a fairly big city. If you like going out in the evening, there are a lot of good restaurants and bars. If you prefer cultural activities, there are museums and art galleries. But if you like nature, there are lots of other things outside of the city which are easy to reach, like the gardens, aqua parks, wildlife, and so on. So, in answering this question, you not only said yes, but you tried to explain where to go to for people that like going out in the evening, for people that like activities like going to museums and art galleries, for people that like nature. You don't have to put it in this structure, but the aim or the goal is that you give extra answers to your first answer. Is there much to do in your hometown? Not really, there's not really much to do in my hometown, but sometimes tourists do come to our city and they look at monuments or they look at statues or they visit the old museum which we have in the center of the town. Now, you just gave two extra sentences to back up your first sentence, showing that you understand or you understood the question. So, next one, what are people like in your hometown? They are mostly quite friendly, but as most big cities, as with most big cities, everyone is often busy, so it may seem as if they are not interested in speaking or having a chat. But if you live there, you know that most people are quite happy to have a chat if they have time and will help you if needed. What we try to do here is to make it not look so negative. In questions like this, what are people like in your hometown? Don't try to paint a negative picture like, oh, they are bad. In fact, they're like uh, beating people, you know, uh, screaming at people or they are wicked. They are not so nice. So don't try to paint a very negative picture about, especially about your country or about the people in your country. Try to give a positive response. So like this one. 
they are mostly quite friendly, but people might not see them like that. But when you get close to them, you understand that they are happy people and they chat if they have time and help you if needed. So you, in a way, you're trying to say that they are different from how people see them. So always try to give a positive answer and not a negative answer about something. Okay, let's look at another question. Do you get many tourists visiting your area? So you can say, mm, not really, no. I live in the inner city and the area is a little run down. It's basically a lot of high rise flats and many of the shops are boarded up. So nothing to interest tourists really, but there are a few tourists who come around sometimes to see our monuments and museums. So here we used Lincoln, which is which are words like mm, um that's a good question. These are Lincoln words. So we will talk about Lincoln in a separate video. But for now, we have some new words like inner city, rundown, high rise flats, boarded up. We will see that uh, as the video goes on, I'll, I'll share like the vocab of um, cities and towns for you to see these vocab and what they mean. So don't worry about it. But in this answer, you can see that we have a little bit of negative answer like no, not really. So I live in the inner city and it's run down. Uh, nothing of interest for tourists but i said but there are a few tourists so i try to paint a positive picture that some tourists do come to my city to see monuments and museums so for part one the aim is that when you ask the question you answer straight to what you answer directly what you were asked for example do you like sports and you say yes i do i spend three to four hours every day playing football which is actually my favorite sport now you just give an extra answer so try to give at least two to three sentences uh for your part one of speaking do not just keep it at one sentence so try to extend to two or three sentences for your part one speaking so let's look at useful vocab here we have boarded up shops. These are shops that no longer are no longer doing business. So these shops are closed. They are not doing business, and they are not going to open for a long time. Maybe because of uh, problems or no money or something like that. So they are closed down. Get around is to move around the place. So to travel around the place. If you get to a city or a town, is it easy to get around? Is it difficult to get around because of the transportation there? So that is what it means to get around. High rise flats are multi story apartments. So, apartments with like two floors, three floors, these are high rise flats. In the suburbs, I already said it, it's outer area of a large town or city, so outside the city. Places of interest are places for visitors and tourists. Lively bars and restaurants are bars and restaurants with good atmosphere so happy people there people are energetic people are active that is a lively bar a restaurant residential area of, is an is a place or area where people live so it's called a residential area for people upmarket shops are expensive shops so you can say in my city there are a lot of upmarket shops which are quite expensive and usually for the rich people we could go there to uh, for um, brow to browse or to look around so to browse is like to move around the place not necessarily to buy anything just to look at the clothes and the shoes and try to understand what they are okay try to understand the price and uh, maybe consider if you're going to buy any of them and the last one traffic congestions are heavy traffic making it difficult to move around the city so when you have cars for example in the morning uh, when it's rush hour, rush hour is like everyone is trying to get to work and you have traffic. So you can't move around the city. It's traffic congestion. Okay, now it's your turn. So you have one to, you've got four to five minutes and let's take the first question. You can answer it on your own. Pause the video. I will give you one minute for each question to for you to answer on your own.
So the first question, where is your hometown? Okay, excellent. Is there much to do in your hometown? All right. And do you like living in the city? Great. <laughs> what are the people like in your hometown? Okay, and remember in case M. Um, fast, uh, in case I'm fast, you can always pause the video and try to answer or go back to look at the answers that I gave and use the same structure. You can put your own words, not a problem, but make sure you make a complete sentence and it should make sense too. So don't just say anything, but let it be uh, connected to the question. So do you get many tourists visiting your area? So do many tourists come to your city or your town? That is the meaning of the question. Great. Now, the knowledge you get from these questions can help you answer any other questions from towns and cities. So, don't say like, if you have a new question like this, are there many art galleries where you live? Then just go blank, like, what am I going to say? I never practice these questions. So, you already have uh, knowledge from uh, what is it like in your city? Do you live in a big or small city? You can use your knowledge from these uh, questions to answer this one. For example, are there many art galleries where you live? Um, none that I know of. I live in a small town, so now you're talking about where you live again. So I live in a small town, so I don't think there are any, though we have a few museums and other cultural institutions. So you're talking about your town. So this is just like the same thing we did. In your capital city, in our capital city, there are quite a few galleries, however. So you just use knowledge from where do you live and what can you do in your town to answer these questions. So are there many art galleries where, where you live? Or you can say, yes, there are a lot of art galleries where I live. Uh, actually, I live in a big city. I live in the capital of the city. And a lot of tourists come around to see um, different art galleries, like the big art gallery we have in the center of the city. You can call the name of the art gallery if you want. It's okay to... Um, to say wrong information, the, the examiner doesn't know exactly uh, if this exists in your city, so it's alright to say that. Uh, so you can say there's a big art gallery and um, uh, a lot of them, so something like that. So you just use knowledge from where do you live and what can you do in your town to answer this question. So your knowledge from other questions can help you answer any question from a topic. Now in the subsequent videos, we are going to talk about other topics for part one. We are going to have uh, maybe food, maybe sports or adverts. So we're going to look at how to talk about such topics, maybe difficult, more difficult topics for you to see how to handle them, how to answer them. But I hope you are able, were able to learn something with um, talking about towns and cities and you'll be able to face any question that has to do with towns and cities. Of course, you need to practice more and look at, look up other vocabulary that has to do with uh, towns and cities in addition to the one that we just learned uh, in this video. So, enjoy your time and see you at the next lesson. Hello and welcome to Zenith Corporate School English. In today's lesson, we will be continuing with IELTS speaking part one. And in this part of the lesson, we will be looking at two different topics for part one speaking, and they are food 
and sports. So we will look at some vocabulary that we will come across during this lesson. So the first one is ready-made. So it's talking about food. So this is a food that is sold ready and or almost ready to be served. So when you go to a restaurant and you buy a food that is already prepared, it's called a ready-made food. The next is takeaway. So a takeaway is a meal or dish bought from a shop or restaurant to be eaten outside the restaurant. Home cooked food is simply food prepared at home. Recipe is a set of instructions for preparing a particular dish or a particular food, including a list of ingredients required. Desserts. Desserts are the sweet course eaten at the end of a meal. So you have a fussy eater. A fussy eater is an eater that is hard to please. So he or she is picky, um, like very hard to choose what he or she wants to eat. So you call them fussy eaters. To eat like a horse means to eat a lot. So someone that eats a lot could be said to eat like a horse. To work up an appetite is to do physical work that leads to you becoming hungry. Processed food are foods treated with chemicals in a food industry. So when you process a food, you treat it with chemicals before you uh, release it to customers. Dairy or dairy products are products from animals like milk, cheese or milk products so these are called dairy products. Intolerance is an inability to eat a food or take a drug without adverse effects. Mandatory is a must, so you must do something, it's mandatory. Sauce is simply a liquid or a semi-liquid substance served with food. So you can have like ketchup or mayonnaise, this could be like a sauce, or you could have a different sauce when served food. So let's begin the part one speaking on food. The first question, do you like to cook? So I will give you a sample answer and I will give you time to answer this same question. So there are two options I have here. The first one is not really, no. Most of the time, I eat ready meals and takeaways. That's one of the reasons I love visiting my mom. You can always guarantee lovely home-cooked food. And the second option is, yes, I really like to cook. And since moving to France, I've become a much better cook. I regularly cook French food from various pies, meat dishes, and fish to sweets and desserts. I was taught some traditional re recipes and methods from my aunt. So these two answers are comparing yes and no. So you can choose any of them. And now try to answer this same question using your own answer. But you can take a vocabulary from this, uh, quite from these answers that you have on the screen and try to answer yours. So. Do you like to cook? Remember, make at least two to three sentences. Okay, so let's go, let's go on to the next question. Is there any food you don't like and why? So again, I have two options. The first one, no, not really. I'm not a fussy eater at all. So remember the meaning of a fussy eater. So I'm not a fussy eater at all. Actually, I eat like a horse. I do a lot of sport and work up an appetite. And the second option, I don't like processed food because it's really bad for my body. After having a particular diet, eating processed food does not agree with my body and can make me feel unwell. So unwell means sick. I always avoid dairy because I have an intolerance. So these two answers, one of them says like, I like to eat, I'm not a fussy eater. And the second one, 
tries to talk about not being able to eat all kinds of food, so being a fussy eater. So try to answer the same question. Is there any food you don't like and why? So again, give two to three sentences. You can pause the video and try to answer that. So let's go on to the next question. What kind of food do you particularly like? I really enjoy eating fresh fish, homegrown vegetables and fruits, and on special occasions, meat that comes from local farmers. I also enjoy fresh eggs from neighbors and family members. Now, you don't have to use the same structure, but the idea is that you need to mention a variety of food that you like, because what kinds of food do you particularly like? So, you can say, I really enjoy eating fresh food, homegrown vegetables, homemade foods, for example, fresh eggs or meat or uh, vegetables that are grown by farmers, by local farmers. So two to three sentences again is okay for part one. So try this question on your own. What kind of food do you particularly like? And after you've answered that, you can continue with this lesson. So let's move on to the next question. What kinds of food are most popular in your country? So this is similar to the previous question. What kinds of food do you particularly like? You can use your knowledge from this question to answer the next question. You can say fresh homegrown vegetables, fruits and meat are part of the staple diet in Greece or in your country. It depends on which country you're from. Particular dishes such as kokinitso, beef cooked in a red wine sauce, is popular, along with other signature dishes, or signature here means special dishes, special food. Of course, a Greek salad is mandatory, as well as a lot of olive oil as in everything, so as well as a lot of olive oil in everything. So in this question, be sure to mention one or two of your country's dish, for example, Spanish tapa or omelette for Spain. So try to answer this same question using your own vocabulary and try to make two to three sentences, complete sentences. So what kind of food are most popular in your country? Let's go on to the next question. Now, you can have a strange question like this. Do you like chocolate? <laughs> but make sure that when you get a question like that, you don't just go blank. Like, do you like chocolate? You can say yes or no. For example, yes, I do. But I can only eat a very dark chocolate or a chocolate that is free from dairy or gluten. So, gluten is like what is made up in uh, chocolate or any other uh, sugary product. So, you have like a component called gluten. So, you can also say, no, I don't like chocolate. In fact, when I was six or seven years old, my mom always bought me uh, a lot of chocolate. But I found out that I didn't finish all of it because I wasn't just so... Uh, used to eating sugary things and I would give most of them to my friends or to my brothers or to my sisters. So in that way, you're trying to give extra information to back up your first sentence. And a second question here, similar to the first one. Do you like chocolate as a child? Sorry, did you like chocolate as a child? So this is a past simple question and you need to use past habit. You need to use words like would or used to. Look at a sample answer here. Of course, when I was about six, my mom would always buy me dark chocolates. I used to keep some of them and share them later on with my friends. But as I grew, I had to cut down on it. So practice these questions. Do you like chocolate? 
Did you like chocolate as a child? Again, you can pause the video and answer these questions and continue with the video after that. Now let's go on to sports. So we looked at a, a variety of questions from, uh, from food and now we are in sports. You can have a question like this in sport. Do you like swimming? And here is a sample answer. I really love to go swimming. Now you can see we are not using easy words like I like or I like, I really like. So we use higher vocabulary like I prefer, I really love to go swimming. Especially in the sea or on a hot day. There are so many great places for swimming where I live, so it is easy to go every day in the summer months. How often do you swim? I try to go swimming every day or at least three times per week. This allows me to do some exercise in the water, which is good for my overall health. Overall here means general health. So try to answer this question again. Do you like swimming? How often do you go to swim? Or how often do you swim? So let's move on to the next question. Do you like to go swimming on holiday? We have a sample answer. I used to before I moved to Australia. Now it is a normal behavior to go swimming in the summer months nearly every day. I prefer to swim in the sea rather than the pool as it, as it is cleaner. There are clear, crisp waters in beautiful surroundings close to our house, which can be easily assessed by car. So here we have a word, we have a phrase rather than. So you can use this phrase to compare two things. For example, I prefer to play football. Rather than going for a walk, I prefer to play basketball rather than sleeping in the house all day. So you're comparing two activities and saying that one is better than the other. Also, we have a word assessed. To assess is to gain some uh, information or gain some entrance into something. For example, you have uh, the beach or you have the sea and you want to go to the sea. And there are no barriers. You can find your way to that beach. So it's accessible. You can easily go to the place by car or by foot or in any other means you're of transport that you're using. So if you can easily get to the place, you can use the word assessed. It can be easily assessed because I can easily get to the place without any problem. So the next question should everyone learn swimming and why? Now, such a question, you can use um, a link in linker, for example, mm, or um, or I think, which is what we use to start this answer. But I think it is a good skill to have, as not only can it benefit your health and overall fitness levels, it can also be a safety skill. Knowing how to swim is important. In case of accidents in water, it could save your life. Now you're trying to talk about the advantage of learning how to swim. It could save your life in cases of accidents in water. People should learn when they are young for enjoyment and for health. And the final question in this slide what activities would you do if you were spending some leisure time at a beach or near the ocean now in this case you need to use the conditional sentences especially in this question you can use the second conditional so you say if i was at the beach i would play volleyball because it's a conditional sentence. If I was at a beach, I would play volleyball, go swimming, and perhaps hire a jet, a jet ski. Traveling through the waters on a jet ski is a lot of fun and a good way to explore caves, coves, and small bays. 
So you can also use your own example. Like if I if I was uh, if I were at um, let's say uh, a stadium, I would play football all day. Perhaps I would rent. Uh, I would get my jersey. I would get my football kits and shoes and boots, and call my friends and we would play football all day. Something like that. Okay, but you can use your own example. Try to give two to three sentences to back up your first answer. So please try to answer these questions on your own. You can use the same structure. So the first question, do you like to go swimming on holiday? Should everyone learn swimming and why? And what activities would you do if you were spending some leisure time at a beach or near the ocean? Once you've done that, you can go on with the video to the next questions. So, we have another question here. Do you think the government should invest money in developing facilities for water sports? So, this question has to do with your opinion, what you think. So, you can use phrases like, in my opinion, like we have in the sample answer. In my opinion, the government should put more funding into healthcare and education first before committing expenses. Committing expenses means investing. It's another way of saying before investing into water sports. On the other hand, so on the other hand, we use for comparing two things. You can say, on one hand, this happened, and on the other hand, I think this should happen. So on the other hand, programs could be implemented to develop areas for water sports which could involve the community and provide new experiences. Next question, what sports do you like and why? I used to enjoy classes like Zumba and body combat, but now really enjoy swimming and running. Swimming and running are great ways to stay fit as they allow me to experience nature as well as exercise. So in this answer we first of all looked at the past i used to do that but now i really enjoy doing this so in that way we extended our answer what sports are most popular in your country so the sample answer we have here in the country i currently live in football and volleyball are really popular there are many local football teams and volleyball tournaments are held once a month in the summer season Try to answer these questions again. Do you think the government should invest money in developing facilities for water sports? What sports do you like and why? What sports are most popular in your country? Now, let's move on to the next set of questions. Do you like daily do you like to do daily exercise? Why or why not? I exercise every day for at least 30 minutes. This includes walking, swimming, or running. In my view, it is important to maintain a healthy lifestyle by exercising and moving the body as much as possible. This can help you to clear your mind and stay positive. Are boys and girls at the same sports? Are boys and girls good at the same sports? I think boys seem more passionate about certain sports like football and rugby, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are better than girls. If a person is dedicated to a sport and has the skills needed to be a success, I don't think it matters if they are a boy or a girl. Please take time to look at the structure of these answers and you can apply them in answering your own questions. One good thing about having a structure for answers is that it can help you in answering even other questions that doesn't have to do with this same topic. If you ask questions about food or if you ask questions about advertising or hobbies, you can use the same structure. For example, you can be asked, do boys and girls like the same food? This is similar to the question, 
are boys and girls good at the same sports? So you can use the same structure, but just add vocabulary that has to do with food. So I believe that you've been able to see a range of questions that have to do with food and sports. And please go back to these questions, try to answer them, go over them again and again, and record yourself, listen to yourself, and see if you were able to make two to three sentences successfully. But I know that if you're able to master these structure of answers, you'll be able to tackle any question that has to do with food or sports. And the next lessons, the subsequent lessons, we'll be looking at different topics and also talking about the part two of the IELTS speaking, which is much more difficult. But we are going to make it very easy for you to understand and show you some tips and some skills you can use in answering these questions. But for now, do enjoy your time and see you at the next video.